Luke chapter number 1. We're just going to read a few verses. We'll begin in verse number 1. I've never preached out of this text. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I've never heard it preached on. And so uh, in studying, the Lord just kind of showed me a little thought here, and I pray to be a blessing to you. In verse number 1, the Bible says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which were from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things, from the very first to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can once again look into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God that is forever settled in heaven, that, Lord, we can become masteries of by having it etched into our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Thank you for it being a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, the absolute and final authority of our lives. Uh, Lord, thank you that in uh, contained therein we find peace and hope and rest and strength. Uh, we find moral fiber. We find everything we need from the pages uh, of thy blessed word. Uh, God, thank you for a good Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Lord, for the good singing. It's a blessing. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that uh, even in this hardship and these trying times, uh, we do have the avenue of live stream. Folks are turning, uh, tuning in, and uh, uh, we're getting comments that folks are getting help and encouragement. And, Lord, that certainly encourages us. Uh, Lord, thank you for the faithfulness of thy people, those that are faithful, Lord, uh, uh, to tune in, those that are faithful to read their Bibles and pray and seek the Lord, uh, those that are faithful to send in their offerings and tithes, those that are faithful uh, to tell others uh, that Jesus is still the answer for their lives. Uh, God, thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you, Lord, for the sanctuary. Uh, too many times we took for granted the privilege afforded us uh, to be able to come in and worship you in spirit and in truth. Uh, God, thank you for those that are in the parking lot listening. Uh, thank you, Lord, for just folks that have a desire uh, uh, to see Jesus high and lifted up and have a desire to once again uh, be able to come to the house of God. Uh, God, I pray that all of this uh, would, Lord, be working for your honor and for your glory, that, God, we'd see great revival break out, uh, that, God, we'd see a great move of God, that we'd see many uh, sinners saved by the good grace of God. Uh, Father, I pray if anybody's lost and watching today, uh, that today would be the day of their salvation. Uh, Father, now help us, Lord, uh, illuminate our minds from your precious truth, uh, and God, do a work in our hearts. Uh, we'll thank you and bless you and praise you for what you do. Uh, I pray, Father, that you would touch the sick. Uh, I do pray that you touch the heart of our governor uh, and governors across this land uh, to open up our country. I pray for those that are struggling. Uh, those that have lost their jobs, uh, those that, Lord, uh, uh, don't know where their next meal's coming from, uh, those that, God, uh, uh, are depressed for being shut in, uh, those that, Lord, are discouraged, I pray that, God, you'd undergird them, you'd do something miraculous in their lives, uh, and, God, I pray that this uh, 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 bondage would come uh, uh, to uh, an end soon, and God will bless you and praise you for what you do. Use this unworthy vessel. Uh, we'll bless you for that as well. Uh, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of the Lord Jesus, uh, the name that we need to be thankful for uh, and thankful for your choice blessings. His name we do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, I want to draw your attention to these four verses we read in Luke chapter number 1. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, that Luke is inspired by the Holy Ghost to pin these words down, uh, and he's doing it for clarifying sake. Uh, in verse number 1, he says, For as much as many have taken in hand uh, to set forth in order a declaration of those things uh, which are most surely believed among us. Uh, 
uh, uh, there came a point uh, 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 after uh, 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 the early church was empowered by the Holy Ghost and folks started getting saved uh, that folks, uh, hallelujah, praise the Lord, went everywhere telling the gospel story. Uh, and what a blessing. I would to God that Christians would go everywhere today telling the gospel story that Jesus saves, uh, Jesus saves. Uh, 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 but I imagine that some getting it second hand, third hand, fourth hand, and fifth hand, uh, uh, and not having a copy of the Word of God, uh, uh, some of them may have told it, and told it uh, maybe not in the correct manner. Uh, can I say in this day and age, uh, there are a lot of places that call themselves churches, uh, there are a lot of places that say they're preaching the gospel, uh, but not all of them are preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Even Paul warned uh, to uh, uh, the G uh, church at Galatia uh, uh, about those that were preaching a other gospel. Uh, here Luke is saying, I'm going to pin this down to clarify uh, 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 what folks are saying and show you uh, 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 what is true. Uh, we not only see the clarifying, he noticed the constricted. Look in verse number 2. He says, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Uh, uh, Luke is saying, uh, uh, even uh, they're coming and trying to tell us their, their uh, uh, slight on it or their view on the gospel. He said, we were the eyewitnesses. We were there from the beginning. He is constricted. He is qualified to tell what happened. Can I say there are a lot of folks that aren't qualified? Uh, you would be amazed at how many people, good-meaning people, want to come and tell me what the Bible says. Now, make no mistake, I do not understand all the Bibles. Brother Jordan brought out in Sunday school, half of them have not even been told. Nobody understands it all. But I have been studying it for 46 years. I do have degrees on my wall from Bible college. I, I have given myself to studying the Word of God. And I don't understand it all, but i got a good handle on some of it. And it amazes me that people don't even know how to walk and chew gum at the same time want to come and tell me what the Bible says. Now listen, if it's true, I'll say amen. But a lot of times it isn't true. A lot of times... These folks, they need to go back and, and find that ball in high weeds because they can't even do that, let alone begin to exhort on what the Scriptures say. And the reason we have 300 different denominations in, a, in America is a lot of people are telling a lot of things that aren't true. Luke says, I'm qualified to tell you what happened because I was there from the beginning. He's clarifying there's a lot of folks saying a lot of things. But I'm qualified. I'm constricted. I am the authority here. Now notice, if you will, the certainty in verse number 4. He says this, That thou mightest know the certainty of those things which thou hast been instructed. He says, I am going to tell you of a certain. There are some things you can take to the bank. There are some things you can build your life upon. There are some things you can anchor your soul to. Uh, there is a foundation of certainty, uh, and that is the truth. That is what you need to anchor in. Uh, listen, uh, 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 sometimes you'll listen to somebody, uh, and they preach something that may not be 100% true. You need to glean the truth uh, and junk the rest. Uh, uh, there are some songs you hear uh, that may have an element of truth to them. Uh, you need to glean the truth uh, and junk the rest. Uh, uh, he's saying, I'm going to give you the certain things that you can anchor your soul to that will help you. Uh, there are a lot of things going on that aren't true. That's like trying to find out uh, what's going on with this virus. Depending on what channel you watch is what you're going to find out. And there's a lot of folks telling some partial truths. There are some that don't have a clue what they're saying. Uh, uh, and and you just trying to find truth is difficult. Uh, Luke says, listen to me. I'm going to tell you the things that are certain. Now notice, if you will, the character mentioned in these first four verses. Look at verse number three. He said, it seemed good to me also having had a had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. Again, he's qualified. He was there. He understands. He walked with Jesus for some three and a half years. He was there when Jesus appeared in the upper room after resurrection. Luke's been a part of all of it. 
And he said, uh, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Now notice this character, Theophilus. When I read his name, I think of that elephant on Sesame Street. What's his name? Snuffleupagus or something. He's got a weird name. Hmm? Theophilus. Now notice some things about this fellow. First of all, we could say he is a noble man. Look what Luke says about him. He says, most excellent Theophilus. This is not a commoner. This is not a plebe. This is not just the offscour of somebody that uh, knows Luke. When he uses the title most excellent, this is a man who is noble. This is a man who has the rule over other people. This is a man who has a, 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 a title and has a authority. Uh, and Luke is writing to clarify uh, some things and make for certain some things that Theophilus had been instructed in. Uh, and he refers to him as most excellent. This is a noble man. Can I say this is a new man? Look what it says in verse 4. The Bible says that, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things uh, wherein thou hast been instructed. Uh, what has he been instructed in? He's been instructed in the gospel. He's been instructed in what uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ did on Calvary and that he rose from the dead. He's been instructed. Uh, he just hasn't heard about it. Uh, he just doesn't know about it. Uh, he has sat under the teaching of it. Uh, he has been instructed in it. Uh, he has believed believed in it, uh, and he is learning the ways of Christianity. Uh, you say, how do you know, preacher? Uh, well, in Acts chapter number 1, uh, and in verse number 1, the Bible says, the former treaties have I made, uh, O Theophilus, uh, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach. Uh, Luke, again, the writer of the book of Acts, uh, is referring again in the first verse of the first chapter to this same fellow. Uh, why is he referring to this fellow? Uh, he is once again confirmed him what he's already written to him uh, and hey what a blessing this noble man uh, this man of authority uh, has put his faith in the Lord he's not only a noble man he's a new man uh, he's a part of the early century church what a blessing uh, I'm glad God saves plebes and commoners uh, and regular folks, but I'm glad God uh, even can save noble folks. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the little YouTube clip. It's about five minutes. Uh, it's called Donald's Bible. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's by uh, uh, Clarence Sexton, uh, 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 who's the pastor and the, and the president of Crown College. Uh, uh, I highly uh, 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 would uh, recommend you uh, pull that up on YouTube and watch that. Uh, uh, it's, it's a little slow for five minutes, uh, 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 but what it all boils down to, uh, and I had about six people send it to me, uh, uh, but what it all boils down to uh, uh, is it is a history lesson. Uh, there was a great uh, 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 revival that broke out in the late 1800s just outside of Scotland, uh, and that great revival broke out because of prayer. Uh, that great revival broke out because there had been a plague, uh, and people were dying, uh, and folks began to get a hold of God. God, uh, and God uh, uh, sent the power of God to that little island and revival broke out uh, and people were saved uh, and men surrendered to preach uh, and it perpetrated from that little island and went uh, throughout Europe uh, and an amazing thing happened uh, 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 is a lady left that island uh, uh, went to England uh, hey uh, uh, married a fellow they migrated to America he said why is all this important uh, one of the men uh, 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 in that great revival uh, was relatives to them uh, and as they began to have children uh, they began to name their children and one of their children was named after that man uh, and they gave that man the Bible that he was named after. Uh, that man's name was Donald. Uh, he's the 45th president of the United States of America and in his office today is the very Bible uh, that came out of that great revival 100 years ago uh, as a result of a plague uh, Hey, maybe God's up to something bigger than we can imagine. Uh, and maybe God's going to do a work through a noble man just like he did in Theophilus' life. Uh, we see he was a noble man. He was a new man. But he's a noteworthy man. 
That word Theophilus, that's his name. Now you know that I have a real interest in names of people in the Bible and their meaning behind their names. Well, it's no accident that Luke included him in both of his writings. That name Theophilus, it's noteworthy because it means friend of God. With God's help, I'm going to preach for just a few minutes this morning on a friend of God. You know what? I believe God would say he's never had too many friends. And can I say it's a blessing to have friends. Abraham Lincoln said, uh, if you live your whole life and you die and you've got five true friends, you're a blessed man. Can I say a true friend is somebody that knows all your, uh, all your strengths and all your weaknesses, uh, all your good traits uh, and all your bad traits, uh, and they still choose to be a friend. Uh, I'm glad, hallelujah, some 2,000 years ago, uh, the God of glory came to this world. Uh, Brother Brian, he knew all of our good traits. Uh, yes, he did. He knew all of our bad traits. Uh, he knew our strengths, uh, and he knew our weaknesses, uh, and he knew there was no way uh, we could make it to heaven on our own. Uh, and he went to the cross of Calvary, uh, and he laid down his life uh, for you and I uh, to be his friend. Uh, he became a friend to publicans and sinners. Uh, and all he asks in return is that we'll be a friend to him. Uh, hey, can I help you with something? It's a blessing to have friends. Uh, I'm glad to say I've got a few friends in this world. Uh, hey, but there's nobody like uh, the lonely Jesus to be your friend. Uh, are you a friend of God today? Uh, hey, he's looking for some friends. Uh, some that'll just hang out with him. Uh, some that'll just walk with him. Uh, some that'll just uh, uh, enjoy the things he enjoys uh, and want to spend time time with him. Uh, are you a friend to, uh, of God? Uh, listen, a friend of God, first of all, has to be cleansed. Uh, uh, God, uh, uh, he is the, uh, uh, he hates sin, uh, and he hates wickedness, uh, and he's angry with the wicked every day. Uh, and if you're going to be a friend to God, uh, you've got to be cleansed. Uh, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, uh, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, uh, we have fellowship one with another, uh, and the blood of Jesus Christ his son uh, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, you can't have fellowship with God uh, unless you've been cleansed. Uh, but if you've been cleansed, uh, you're a good candidate to be a friend of God. Uh, John 15, 14, Jesus said, you are my friends. Uh, if you do whatsoever I command you, what he command us? Uh, he said, eh, that we're to repent. Uh, you shall all likewise repent. Uh, he said in verse 15, henceforth, uh, I call you not servants, uh, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. Uh, but I've called you friends, uh, for all things that I've heard of my Father I've made known unto you. Uh, are you a friend of God? Uh, if you're going to be a friend of God, you've got to be cleansed. Uh, can I say this? Uh, a friend of God is compassionate. Uh, our Heavenly Father uh, is a loving, compassionate God. Uh, he is love. Uh, and He showed His love by sending His Son into this world. Uh, and can I say, uh, uh, if you're going to be a friend of God, you've got to be compassionate too. Uh, over there in Matthew 18, uh, verse 27 uh, Jesus giving a parable to the disciples uh, he said then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion uh, and loosed him uh, and forgave him the debt uh, then down in verse 33 after explaining the parable he says this to his disciples uh, shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant uh, even as I had pity on thee uh, you want to be a friend of God you got to be compassionate because God had compassion on you and can I say, when you're right with God, you want to have compassion on people. You want to give them the benefit of that. You care for people. You love people. You're concerned about people. A friend of God is cleansed. A friend of God is compassionate. Can I say something else about a friend of God? Are you, are you God's friend? Can I say a friend of God's a cheerful giver? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And that's what the Bible says. I got to thinking about the kind of givers God loves. The kind of givers that are friends of God. Can I say, first of all, they give an ear. 
they've learned to listen. Sometimes people don't need our opinions, Brother Brian. They just need somebody to listen. They say a sounding board. Folks are going through a lot. And can I say, people don't know you care until they know you're willing to listen to them. God loves a cheerful giver. He loves people who give an ear. Somebody there to listen. How many times in the middle of the night your heart's troubled, you called on God and he listened to you? God loves a cheerful giver. He loves somebody who gives an ear. He loves somebody who gives an effort. Uh, God don't expect you to, to, to change the world. He just expects you to try. He just wants you to give an effort. Now, Brother Clint, he don't want you to give Brian's effort. He wants you to give your effort. He just wants us to give an effort. Huh? Can I say, everybody can do something. You don't have to do everything. Just do something. God loves a cheerful giver. And when you give an effort and you give it because you're, you're glad to be able to do it, God loves that. Can I say this? He loves someone that gives an ear cheerfully. Somebody gives an effort cheerfully. He loves somebody that gives an evening cheerfully. Somebody gives of their time. Gives an evening of their time. You know, used to, we'd say we were so busy, we didn't have time. We can't say that anymore. Brother Brian said when he came in, man, everybody's lawns are manicured, everybody's cars are polished, Every, I mean, everybody's silver's polished, everybody's tables are polished, Every, I mean, people are going stir crazy. And I say, when you give an evening of your time to somebody, especially when your time is valuable, God takes note of that. Sometimes people just need to, uh, somebody come by and show them they care. God loves a cheerful giver. Those that give an ear, effort, evening. God loves somebody gives empathy. You know why you go through so much? Because there's somebody down there you're going to be able to minister to on down the road. And you can draw from your experiences how God brought you through and you can show empathy to them and tell them that God can bring them through. God loves it when you do that. Can I say God loves a cheerful giver? He loves... Those that give exemption. Those that are willing to forgive somebody. Man, there's too many people in this world carrying a grudge. Got a chip on their shoulder. Can't forgive. You don't know what, what, what they did to me, preacher. And I know what we did to Jesus, and he forgave us. Can I say, it's not always easy to forgive, but it's always right to forgive. How can we expect God to forgive us for Christ's sake if we're not willing to forgive somebody else? God loves folks that forgive. And can I say, God loves folks that give of their earnings. You knew I was going to get the money eventually, huh? But he does love folks that give of their substance that his house might be full. God loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to be a friend of God, you've got to be a cheerful giver. You've got to be cleansed. You've got to be compassionate. Are you a friend of God? I thought about this. A friend of God is a cross bearer. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Can I say, if you're going to be a friend of God, you're going to be associated with God, and being associated with God comes at a price. Not everybody loves God. Just go on social media and look at what people say of churches that are trying to have church right now. Can I say, any church that's trying to have church right now is not trying to have church to upset somebody. They're trying to have church to worship God. It's not about other people. It's about God. And yet, if you look at social media, they will talk about Christians like we're dogs. You don't care about people's safety, does Kroger's? Does Menard's? Does Lowe's? Does everybody else that's open out there care about safety? Well, bless God, they're practicing social distancing. I just had a story yesterday where they got, you know, not six feet. They had ten feet in between where you can stand to go check out. And one of the clerks there was over patting somebody on the shoulder. I'm thinking, she's not practicing social distancing. Hmm. Say, so what's the deal? The deal is it's not really about safety. I promise you, if they didn't have the rules then nobody would have that tape on the lines for you to have to wait. Hmm? It's not about safety. You know what it is out there? It's about the dollar. You know what it is in here? It's about the Lord. 
But see, it's not about us not caring, but if you're going to be a friend of God, you're going to be labeled. And can I say, there is a cross to bear in being a Christian. A lot of folks don't want to bear the cross. Matter of fact, I'm, going to, I'm just going to make it clear, hopefully not in our church, but I'm going to tell you there are a lot of folks who used to be straddling the fence on going to church faithfully. Now, because of all this live stream, they're going to become less faithful because they found out they can watch it in their pajamas and they don't have to be accountable to anything. That's not scriptural. But if you're going to be a friend of God, you're going to get labeled and you're going to have to bear a cross. Can I say this? You'll have to, to maybe bear the cross of a call. It is not easy in this day and age carrying the cross of a call. When God has put a call on your life, it doesn't matter what the politician says. It doesn't matter what society says. It doesn't matter what everybody else thinks. It matters what God says. I'm sure Abraham was looked at very funny when he told his family, I'm leaving and heading out. They said, why? Because God told me to, uh, I had to leave. And they said, well, where are you going? I don't know. Well, how long are you going to before you get there? I don't know. Well, what God, what's God going to do? I don't know. Well, why are you going? Because God said to. I'm sure they thought he was crazy. But you know what the Bible calls Abraham? The friend of God. Sometimes bearing your cross and bearing the call is not popular. You say, Brother Doug, God never called me to preach. You still got a cross to bear. You might have to bear the cross of contempt. You might be harassed on the job. You may be harassed in your family. You'll certainly be harassed in the world just be for being the friend of God. Listen, the only indictment they ever had that stuck with Jesus is he was the friend of publicans and sinners. God help us if we're not indicted for being called the friend of God. Hmm? Can I say, you're, you're going to face contempt. Isn't it amazing every time a politician talks about talking to uh, 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 somebody of the religious world about perspective on opening up churches, they always talk to a Catholic priest? I've never once heard any of them say, I talked to an independent Baptist. Because they know where we stand. They want a license to keep doing what they're doing, so they're not going to ask us because we're going to tell them what the Bible says. They don't want to hear that. They want a license to live and do as they please. Isn't that the way of the world? Well, we've got the authority of God's Word. And if you stand on it, you're going to face contempt. It's a cross to bear. Can I say this? You'll bear conflict. You're going to face some hardships. The Bible says, Yea, they, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You're going to face some thorns. Jesus went to the cross with a crown of thorns on his head. You're going to bear a cross, and there are going to be some thorns. There are going to be people who want to pierce you. There are going to be people who want to destroy you. There are going to be storms that you do not understand. There are going to be all kinds of things that come against you for the audacity of you want to be a friend of God. It's a cross to bear. And we all have a choice. What separates Christians from real Christians, separates saved people from really saved people, is there are folks saved going to heaven, blood washed, but they're not really saved. Really saved folks bear a cross. Really saved folks say, I don't do this out of convenience. I'm not doing this just to go to heaven. I do this because I want to be a friend of God. Can I say? Read your Bible. There's not a whole lot of friends of God mentioned. You'll find a few. You'll find an Enoch. You'll find an Elisha. You'll find a few. But you're not going to find the masses lining up to bear a cross. But those that do, not only do they get the title of being the friend of God, they get the fellowship of being God's friend. And can I say it's worth any cross you'll ever have to bear. I thought about this. A real friend of God is committed. The Bible says in Job 5, 8, I would seek unto God... And unto God would I commit my cause. 
The psalmist said in Psalms 37, 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 19, Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Friends of God are committed. Far more than just bearing a cross, they're committed. Can I say they're committed to walk with God? To walk with God means you have to deny your flesh. Can I say it is a 24-hour day job nailing your flesh down? Your flesh don't want to walk with God. Your flesh don't want to face obstacles. Your flesh doesn't want to be harassed. Your flesh does not want hardships. Your flesh wants to go away of no conflict, no problems, just pie in the sky, and then get to go to heaven. But unfortunately, a friend of God has to walk with God. And that takes commitment. That takes commitment regardless of the hardships, the trials, the obstacles. It takes commitment. You walk with God. Hmm? I, I imagine when we get to heaven, you look Enoch up and say, Enoch, are you sorry you walked with God? you say, au contraire. No, no, no. Greatest thing I ever did in my life. I got to walk with him. I took one step from this world to glory. And can I say those that walk with God, the things of this world, they don't attach themselves to them because they've got their focus on the heavenlies. Can I say a friend of God not only walks with God, a friend of God is committed to worship God. That's why so many are struggling right now because we are being told worshiping God in God's setting under God's precepts is non-essential. Not to us. It is our very lifeline. It is what propels us and keeps us sane in this insane world. And those that are friends of God are committed to worship even if it is tuning in on a live stream. You're going to worship God. You're going to praise God. As difficult as it is to have these services with nobody here, you still, when you make the effort to it, Brother Brian, you got blessed singing that song about thanking the Lord. Hmm? It's not the way we choose to. But he still said we're two or three gathered in his name, he'd be in the midst. You're committed to worship God in whatever way is possible. Can I say, we don't like bringing out church history where they had to meet in dens and caves, but they met in dens and caves and they worshiped God. Real friends of God are committed. They're not only committed to walk with God and worship God, but they're committed to warn others of their lost condition. Friends of God want everybody to be a friend of God. And friends of God take on the very desires of God, and it's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And friends of God want to see folks saved, because that's what God wants. He wanted to save you. He wanted to save you long before you even knew you needed to be saved. And friends of God are patient and tell others about Jesus. How many have you, you seen get saved that you had a burden for and you wanted them to get saved long before they ever did, but you're just glad they got saved? My dear friends, real friends of God are committed. They're cross bearers. They're compassionate. They're certainly cleansed. And they're cheerful givers. I ask you, are you a friend of God? I've got good news. He's got plenty of room for more friends. And there's nothing like hanging out and fellowshipping with him. There's no one like him. Are you really a friend of God? Or are you a companion of God? There's a difference. There's a difference in knowing God and walking with God. Are you a friend of God? If not, why don't you commit in your heart you're going to be? Maybe you're watching or listening you're not saved. Why don't you get saved? Start this journey of friendship that you'll never be sorry for. If you're here and listening and you are saved, you're watching, you are saved, are you a friend of God? Y'all be thankful for your friends. But are you thankful for the greatest friendship you can ever have? You got a friendship with God? 
Are you really friends of God? If so, you don't have to tell others. They know. It's our prayer that we take to heart that there's a most excellent the- Theophilus. He's a noble, noteworthy man because he's a friend of God. Can I tell you the most noble people in this world? They, many of them don't even have a title. But they're the friends of God. They're a peculiar people. A royal priesthood. A chosen generation. They are above the rudiments of this world. Are you one of those? We sing that song in the choir. You sing it. I'm glad I'm one of them. I want to be a friend of Jesus, the old hymn writer wrote. God help us to be God's friend. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the charge. God, help us to not only desire to be your friend, but, Lord, put our life in order and do these things to be your friend. Lord, you said, draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you. God, if somebody has a desire to be your friend, Lord, I know you desire them to be your friend, and God, you'll work in their life where they'll have that sweet fellowship to be your friend. God, I pray for anybody that's watching that aren't, and that's not saved. I pray that wherever they are, that conviction Brother Jordan spoke of in Sunday school would light in on their soul, and God, they wouldn't rest until they give their heart and life to Jesus, repent of their sins, and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. And God, start that journey of friendship with you. Father, I pray for your children, Lord, that are acquaintances, but they don't have that fellowship that you desire. I pray, Lord, they'd become the friend of God even before this day is over. Bless now throughout this day. God, be with your people. Lord, help them. Grow them in their darkness and in their valleys. And God, send revival because of these hard times we're facing. God, bless the service tonight. And Lord, bless these that helped in the service this morning. Father, get glory to your name, and Father, help us to be the friend to you that you are to us, and we'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you. We're praying for you. Tune in again tonight, 6 o'clock. Until then, be a friend of God. All right? God bless you. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.